here at the moment. Oh, Just might really. be Amy. You want me to wait, Amy, to see somebody else volunteers first? Or <laughs> not Amy, I'm trying so I'm saying joy, never mind. <laughs> oh, ignore my temporary confusion. I was digging out a piece of paper, but I got one. You figured you were nailed anyway, huh? <laughs> I figured, yeah. Okay. Thank you. But she does such a nice job. Yeah, see, that is one of the problems when you do a really good job like that. Anybody else is afraid to follow that up or fill yeah. in, you know? That means I got to start dropping the ball. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, wearing, I'm in M82, Omni, from the newsletter. I just posted it online. It looks really, that's a really great shot. Yeah, I've got uh, the new rig all set up, and I, all the par parts and pieces have come in, but the bands have just throttled forward so that I'm playing the, every uh, night of the week. <laughs> body, the, what is it? Bodies, Bodies Galaxy? Uh, is that? I always called it Bodes, but is it is it supposed to be Bodes? Bodes Galaxy. I don't know. Is it the cigar or the? Oh, know, this the, is cigar. It's a cigar. M eighty two is a cigar. Okay. Yeah. It's best one I've best one I've got so far. Or or exploding. No, the colors are awesome on there. That, that Thank you. Really like. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I don't see anybody. Not, not I bad assume for, you're all set, not, Jim. Not bad for 27 yeah, hours so. exposure. Yeah, I just got to click on the right uh, on the right one of two options when Jeff turns me on. Yep. We are all set. And where is Charlie? Where is Jim? Oh, you're right there. And as you might remember, Jim, I usually really start at like at seven thirty-five, just to allow those few people to come in a little bit late. Yeah, yeah. Called what is it? Day view of M time or <laughs> time or something like that. <laughs> well, officially, U of M time is a thing of the past, but. Uh, they get off 10 minutes early instead of uh, 10 minutes after the hour when everything starts. Ah. Doesn't make any difference time-wise to the students, but uh, if it says a 9 o'clock class, 9 o'clock things begin. They really mean 9 now. Yeah, I know. I, I, got, <laughs> I got so used to it. It was very confusing in a workplace. It's like, well, is that uh, Michigan time or regular time? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to switch to our grid. <laughs> so all of our lovely faces are now being broadcast. Jeff and I were talking the other day, Charlie, uh, about uh, campus. I, I graduated uh, up at Ann Arbor in 1960 and it, from the engineering school when it was still on main campus. We were just, wow. just, just starting to transfer out to North Campus at that time. Yeah, I had. I was one. <laughs> I had uh, East Engine or West Engine? East Engine, West yeah. Engine. I, I was I, yeah, they moved to well when did North Campus get built? That was late seventies or well it kinda yeah. evolved. Yeah. Okay. I think the engineering college made their moves in the early eighties. And by the time I got there in eighty four, the engineering had largely moved out. And uh, in 95, they gutted both buildings and uh, refurbished them. Uh, so that the, when they reopened, they were, I mean, you wouldn't recognize the, the hallways and stuff. 
they got rid of that uh, you know depression era uh, olive green and funny gra uh, glass fixtures and the asbestos piping uh, all kinds of stuff so there was some rooms in East Engineering that uh, I I swore that my parents could never ever see that room because they would stop the check immediately. <laughs> I there was windows that never closed in the winter; they couldn't be closed, and uh, asbestos was peeling off the pipes, and it was just it was a dump. Mm -hmm. But you know, East Engine had or Engineering had been uh, they evacuated uh, East Engine and left a lot behind a lot of crud and. Uh, I don't know, unmaintained properties. Well, that explains uh, what, uh, what uh, my math class was like when I had a pretty Yeah, we all have funny ticks from uh, being at that uh, classroom. <laughs> but we got through. Uh, I think about uh, halfway through my uh, term there, uh, we ended up moving a lot of classes up to North Campus. So I was one of the uh, early commuter students that uh, were used to going back and forth between the two campuses to get uh, computer science classes. Now I did I did evade punch cards. I didn't have that, but I did have mag tape and uh, the mainframe. So probably one of the last classes. I actually I know I was the last class to get assembly language on the mainframe. So that's raw. <laughs> yeah. It was fun. <laughs> I'd heard I stories heard about that. I college having to do a program and punch or store it on punch cards, and then we had to have a backup on paper tape. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, back, back when I was there, we had the pre, pre, predecessors of punch cards that would they were called slide rules <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> slide rules are cool actually here i was waiting for something really cool and like nope slide rules oh, <sighs> fell for it well it qualified we put a man on a moon with slide rules so uh and uh i was a slide rule kid i no, I went through 65 and then dropped out. I did uh, mathematical economics in 86 down at University of Toledo. We were using punch cards and trying to scramble to, to get to the computer center to get our reads out, readouts before they closed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, I, my late brother-in-law, who was a glass blower, uh, he had a saying, he said, uh, I've seen the past and it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know why they invented computers, right? Because what? Uh, slide rules, you can't use them to add and subtract. Like, they can do anything else but not add and subtract. Well, we were, we were pretty good at addition and subtraction. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. I had to deal, well, with, the, I had to deal with token ring. And I think Charlie's about to get his Start, you're not so gonna say me ready. Here you go, right here. Yep. Okay. Cool. Oh, you don't. You don't. All right. right. How much is this worth? Oh yeah. That, a post verse <laughs> along. <laughs> I've got one of those. Believe it or not. not yeah, I still got one. And this is this was. I know this is politically incorrect because this was a really nice one that my dad had. Mm -hmm. This is how we engineered a lot of his engineering in the day. <laughs> yeah. No computers, but it's yeah. it's ivory, not uh, plastic. Ooh. Oh yeah, Ooh. they were good. Those sturdy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and get started then. So you have found your way into the May edition of the University of Overall Astronomers. Boy, these meetings are clicking by fast, aren't they? So. As uh, probably everybody knows, I am the uh, president of the club. Uh, I might have a little bit to say after our speaker, and we'll hear from some other officers, I'm sure. But uh, as tradition would have it, we always have our guest speakers speak to us first. Uh, some people may be interested in that, not the business meeting afterwards. So if that's the case, we may allow you to escape after the speaker and not feel too bad about it. So, But anyway, with that, uh, oh, and also just a reminder that we are being recorded on YouTube. 
Uh, our speaker is Jim Shedlowski, who has spoken to us, is it two times before or three, Jim? This would be the third. Okay, that's what I was trying to think of, third or fourth. Hey, let's make it four, huh? Anyway, uh, Jim is a longtime member and a former treasurer of the Warren Astronomical Society and also rockability legend who worked for 36 years as a vehicle development engineer and manager specializing in acoustics and noise and vibration and retired from that in 1999. He graduated from the University of Michigan in 1960 with a degree in engineering physics and he spent two years as an officer in the U.S. Army in Germany. And I mentioned rockability legend because in his spare time, he wrote and recorded music for Epic and Roulette Records as one of the Ski Brothers who appeared on Dick Clark's Bandstand in 1958. In 2015, they released their latest album called That's All She Wrote after 57 years. Uh, one of Jim's astronomical interests uh, is very, very large telescopes. And that's what he's going to speak to us tonight, in particular, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, a.k.a. LSST. That's a lot easier to say. Uh, and this is one of the most exciting of the next generation giant telescopes. Uh, it's going to be a very sophisticated or do a very sophisticated survey of the entire southern hemisphere in great detail and also in a new dimension time. So it'll be interesting to hear about that. Also, what will be very interesting is Jim's going to explain how we actually can get involved in one of their programs. So with that, I would like to turn over to Jim to talk to us about the LS, LSST, uh, which is, is it deeper, wider, and now I blew the title. But anyway, you got the idea. So take it away, Jim. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, see if I can get my screens properly here now. Uh, this is the one I want, I believe. Are we proper here? Uh, yep. Okay. Uh, nope. Nope. Good Please. evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hang on. And welcome to a virtual rescreening of September of a. a of a presentation I made a couple, uh, a, two years ago in September to the Warren Club. Hey, I Jim. get the screen off. Uh, there we go. You got uh, um, your presentation screen that you're broadcasting here. You want to switch okay. to the other one. And, and I've got I've got to go back, got to get out yep. and choose the other one. Yeah, let's make sure I get it. Okay, let's try this again. So I want to do... You okay now? Yeah, there we go. Yep. That's it right there, Jim. Okay. Okay, thanks. There, there's two options, so I always get the wrong one. So, oh, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a virtual rescreening of my 13th annual September Cranbrook Institute of Science storytelling episode. This year's presentation will tell the story of a project which was that decade's number one priority for the National Science Foundation in ground-based astronomy and which may revolutionize our understanding of the solar system, our galaxy, and indeed our entire universe. I'll describe the unique instrument, telescope, and camera system, the facility and observatory housing it, the amazing program that it is tasked with, and the incredible data handling and management system which will furnish the ast astronomical and data and information that has never be been never be before been available and on a scale surpassing that of all previous attempts information that will be made available not only to the worldwide astronomical community but to you and I and citizen scientists everywhere but first, let me clear up some things that have changed since I created this presentation back in 2018. Then, the LSST name stood for the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope itself and the observatory and the astronomy program to be executed. Just last year, 
And now the observatory has been renamed the Vera Rubin Observatory after the astronomer who made dark matter a household astrophysics name. The telescope itself is now officially called the Simone Survey Telescope after an early significant donor. And the LSST name now officially is an acronym for the 10 year program to be executed, or it's called the quote, legacy survey of time and space, end of quote. So please ignore the very minor semantical, semantical different discrepancies in terminology that may occur in a few places throughout the presentation. At the end of the presentation, if I have time, I'd like to also briefly discuss some re significant recent developments, developments which threaten to compromise the science capabilities of this telescope and its program. Okay. I'm trying to get it to switch here. Mm -hmm differently. Some of you may remember this slide, the final slide from my 2017 Cranbrook presentation, which I gave you guys last uh, July, I believe it was, that was entitled The Evolution of Giant Telescopes. In that presentation, I mentioned the LS LSST at, at only 8.4 meters as one of the four future giant telescopes currently under construction the smallest future giant, but arguably the most important. What is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or the, now the Vera Rubin Telescope? And why will it be so significant to our understanding of the universe? You might ask, as I did, what is a survey telescope? And why is it important? The key word here is survey, or more specifically, what is an astronomical survey? and what is its significance. Sky surveys have played an important role in astronomy since its earliest existence as a science. One of the first sky surveys was performed by Hipparchus in 129 BC and gave us one of our first catalogs containing the rough locations of about 890 stars. Over the years, technology has improved and so have surveys. By the 16th century, Tycho Brahe's surveys had plotted the positions of more than a thousand stars to within a small fraction of a degree, along with planetary positions, which allowed Kepler's laws of planetary motion to be calculated. <clears throat> with the advent of the telescope, surveys became even more descriptive, precise, and valuable. William Herschel, for example, located and categorized thousands of deep sky nebula while producing the first NGC catalog, still used today. And what amateur astronomer is not beholden to Charles Messier for his list of Messier objects? These early surveys became the basis for the organized practice of the science of astronomy. Then along came photography and sky surveys took another leap forward beginning in 1885 with Harvard's, Harvard's famous plate collection, which used Edward Pickering's computers to analyze the locations and brightness of stars from the entire Southern and Northern hemisphere from photographic plates. We we're just talking about uh, computers a moment ago, but before pen punch cards and slide rules, they, were, they hired women to do that because they were they were lower wage at the time. I think some of you know that story. But this uh, Harvard collection grew to a collection of over 500,000 plates. The efforts of such women as Henrietta Leavitt and Anna Jump Can Annie Jump Cannon in these surveys played key roles in Hubble's discovery of the universe back in the 1920s. Another notable milestone in photographic surveys came about in the 1950s with the Palomar Observatory Sky Survey's use of its 48-inch Schmidt Wide Field Telescope to catalog over 89 million celestial objects down to a magnitude of about 22 and was used for decades to catalog and categorize these objects. 
The final phase of sky surveying became, be, began in the 1990s when much to the chagrin of traditionalists like Gary Ross, who's a non-computer user in the Warren Club, computing power came of age and continues to the present day. The digitalization of surveys. It first involved the digital scanning of earlier ph photographic surveys and then direct digital imaging surveys and finally the use of computational algorithms to analyze the increasing mass of data. This has given astronomy a powerful new tools. Cu coupled with other mo modern technology, modern digital sky surveys have revolutionized the science of astronomy by enabling the correlation of data from many observations across frequency domain, domains through time intervals, red shifts, and the like on statistical significant samples. This has fostered and advanced the practice of virtual astronomy, whereby astronomers in the future will increasingly do their research by mining data <clears throat> from numerous widely available sky survey databases. And so now, <clears throat> let us return to the LSST, the most significant step to date in this increasingly significant field of astronomy. The LSST program is a project that a decade long sky digital survey of the entire Southern hemisphere which is much more comprehensive and sophisticated than any previous astronomical survey, paving the way for the virtual astronomy of the future. The program involves the design and building of a unique 8.4 meter telescope with an integral of 3,200 megapixel. If I've got my figures right, that would be a 3.2 petapixel camera that will survey the entire southern sky twice a week for 10 years with a sensitivity and resolution never before achieved in five wavelengths and with for the first time the added dimension of time. It also includes the development of a sophisticated system for the handling, analyzing, storing, and efficient retrieval of the massive amount of data to be generated. The costs for this program are projected to be just over $1 billion and are, and are primarily provided by the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy with notable private dis contributions. You can see here Bill Gates and uh, Charles Simonier. As Charles Simonier gave $20 million, which kicked off the program by paying for the original, the main mirror. These costs are not only for the construction of the instruments, but also for the creation of the sophisticated data handling network and the operations of the whole system for 10 years. Let me see if I can get my, uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, I thought it was kind of interesting that Bill Gates had donated $10 million to this, pro to this project. The observatory is being constructed near La Sabrina in central Chile in the dry, clear Andes at an altitude of 8,750 feet, where the top of the El Chero Pachon mountain has been leveled off. The LSST was proposed in 2001 in the construction of its unusual 8.4 meter primary mirror that we'll talk about later, was begun with private funds from Charles Simonier at the University of Arizona's Keras Mirror Lab in 2007. It then became the top ranked ground based astronomy in the 2010 National Science Foundation's Astrophysics Decadal Survey. And the project officially began on August 1st, 2014. You can see the yellow, the yellow arrow here on the chart. With funding from the National Science Foundation, and it's scheduled to begin full science operations in late 2022. You can see the red arrow over here. And it's on schedule. The LSST is directed at providing new insight into the dynamic universe in four specific areas of astronomy. 
First, since the current cosmological models maintain that the universe is made up of 68% dark energy and 27% dark matter, about which we know very little, and only 5% of normal visible matter, the LSST will probe the nature of dark matter and dark energy by mapping and measuring several billion galaxies through time and space and studying their influence on the distortion <coughs> of by refining and using microgravitational lensing and redshift measurement techniques and obtaining statistically large samples, the dynamic behavior of dark energy and the influence of dark matter on the development of cosmic structure will be pursued. Interestingly, the $168 million investment of the Department of Energy to build the LSST's camera is largely prompted by this goal. The goal in the continuing quest for the unified theory of everything. <clears throat> Secondly, the LSST's unprecedented power of discovery will be a giant leap forward in solar system studies. It will measure the dynamic properties of several million moving objects, 10 to 100 times more than now known out to the Coupier belt and to the Oort cloud, including the orbital color and variability information. Among the objects to be detected are near earth objects with its superior imaging uh, capabilities, enabling it to find asteroids as small as 140 meters in diameter, as far away as the main belt asteroid. <clears throat> Depending upon the <clears throat> chosen survey strategy, LSST could detect up to 90% of all these potentially hazardous asteroids to meet the 2005 congressional mandate, which said that we have to find 90% of the potentially hazardous NEOs sized 140 meters or larger by the end of, the, of 2020. With these much more detailed measurements of the current state of small bodies in the solar system, we can gain new insight into how planets form and how our solar system evolved over its history. Next, the LSST will revolutionize the time domain astrophysics or the study of how astronomical objects vary with time by imaging the entire night sky, re night sky repeatedly to great depth and with excellent image quality over a 10 year period of time. It will reveal new information about known kinds of variable stars and cosmic explosions such as supernova as well as discover entirely new classes of transient events. Within a minute of each significant transient event detection, the LSST will generate an alert to the worldwide astronomical community to allow them to respond and catch events before they fade forever and study them in detail. Finally, the LSST's huge and accurate collection of data will enable us to answer some fundamental questions about our home galaxy, the Milky Way. Over the course of the 10 year survey period, it will make hundreds of observations of each surveyed area of the sky. A single visit to the entire survey area will map out more than 10 times the volume of past surveys. When stitched together, in time, this set of observations will yield the motions of millions of Milky Way stars. And when stacked in depth, this set of observations will yield a map of over a thousand times the volume of past surveys, cataloging the colors and brightnesses of billions of new stars. So how can we achieve this ambitious, these ambitious goals? With a magnificent instrument system and an organized strategy for using it. The instrument system involved is a unique and sophisticated telescope with a powerful integral camera along with the supporting facility or observatory to house, service and maintain and operate it in a semi-autonomous mode for its 10 year program life. <clears throat> 
The optical system of this telescope is a three mirror wide angle, quote, Paul Baker, end quote, design as modified by Roger Angel at the University of Arizona, which incorporates the primary and tertiary mirror surfaces into one of the U of A's rotary cast 8.4 meter lightweight honeycomb mirrors. The secondary mirror is a large convex mirror. The telescope incorporates the digital camera with its three large lenses into the overall optical design. This design yields a very wide 3.5 degree field of view in an optically fast or F1.2 F1 and structurally compact design with a physical length of only 6.4 meters from its secondary to its tertiary mirror. The optical elements in this unusual astrograph configuration are quite distinctive. The primary mirror or M1 is 8.36 meters or 329 inches in diameter that integrates a separate 5.12 meter central segment, which constitutes the tertiary mirror surface or M3 and yielding an unobstructed primary equivalent of 6.67 meters. The secondary mirror is a convex mirror, 3.4 meters in diameter, the largest convex mirror ever made. The primary length for the camera is 1.55 meters in diameter the largest lens ever made and more than 150% of the size of the 40 inch Yerkes refractor objective, which has historically been astronomy's largest lens. The LSST camera is oddly enough being built by the particle physics folks at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. It is the size and weight of a small car and positioned in the middle of the telescope. With a 3200 megapixel detector, it is, quote, the most powerful camera ever built, unquote, yielding ultra high definition images that are equivalent to 1500 HD TV screens with a very fast readout time of only two seconds. The detector array is built from 189, excuse me, 189 16 megapixel CCDs with a diameter of about 25 inches that will cover a field of view of 3.5 degrees or about seven times that of the moon as shown here with a pixel size of 0.2 arc seconds. It will operate at a temperature of a minus 100 degrees centigrade or 158 minus 158 Fahrenheit to optimize performance. It has a built-in set of six filters as shown here in this uh, automation, ranging from near ultraviolet to near infrared with a filter changing mechanism for fast changes. The field of view contrasted with an ordinary, if you can think of an eight meter telescope as being ordinary, class telescope in, in the Gemini, one of the Gemini telescopes in, in down in uh, Chile also. This shows the field of view of, uh, of the Gemini telescope as opposed to the LSST telescope. The short length or 8.4 meter optical system of the LSST is very significant in the compact structural design of the telescope, which is important to a mission needing mechanical agility. The three point the 350 ton structure of the telescope is supported by an Altas mount, which can be repositioned, which can reposition the telescope every 39 seconds, a thousand times a night, and then accurately track it for the pairs of 15 second exposures and do this routinely and reliably for 10 years. By the way, for any of you telescope design out experts out there, it has an etan du of 319 meters squared per degree square, degree squared versus four for a normally large telescope. All of this hardware is housed in a facility carefully designed to facilitate the highly automated operation of the telescope 
as well as its maintenance and servicing. The site is located on a tract of land owned by the American Universities for Research in Astronomy, or ARA, based in Kitt, at Kitt Peak in Arizona. That also includes the Gemini South and SOAR, S-O-A-R, observatories, and with which the LSST will share utilities and support staffing. The observation program will average 300 or 825 pairs of, of uh, photos per night. One visit is two photos to exclude cosmic ray effects. <clears throat> or or 2.5 million visits in the 10 year program. The, uh, uh, and where am I here? I'll get it back here. The program content will consist of 90% 90, 90 of the baseline region, which is in the blue area here or 18,000 degrees squared compared to uh, 20.6 20 thousand or 20,600 for one whole hemisphere <clears throat> in which that region will be visited twice a week. The remaining 10% of the program will be allocated to special, special interest applications such as the small and large Magellanic clouds and so on. The program control will be highly automated and managed by a software program, which in turn provides the outputs to control the telescope and camera, and also provides the detailed documentation surrounding each photo. This electronic manager, which is named OPSIM, includes a detailed model of the telescope and inputs for sky conditions, weather, and other parameters surrounding the specific data file or photo. This observing program will, extend, will expand our identification of celestial objects to over 18 billion objects in the first year, and by a factor of more than 1,000 over previous surveys by 2030. It will increase the number of known type 1a supernova, the standard candle of the modern astrophysics in the universe, from about 1,000 now to over 1.5 million. It will catalog 5 million new asteroids and will expand by 10 to 100 times the number of small solar system bodies than those presently known. The survey will, for the first time, provide a meaningful basis for dark matter and dark energy studies using weak gravitational lensing astronomy. All of these and more are the expected results from this 10 year survey by an instrument that will obtain 5 million photos to a magnitude of 27 and a resolution of 0.7 arc seconds. If these are the expected results, what then will be the unexpected results? And how will all this be done with data? Massive amounts of data to be obtained, transported, stored, analyzed, and disseminated to scientists around the world with a significant consideration to us, citizen scientists, for our education and participation. On a daily or nightly basis, some 20 terabytes of data, roughly equivalent to the contents of the National Library of Congress, will be transported by, by dedicated high capacity fiber optic lines from Chile to the National Center for Superconducting Applications at the University of Illinois in Champaign, Illinois. Over the 10 year program of the life of the program, this will result in a total of 60 petabytes of data. Every image will be examined as received and compared to the previous images of the same segment of the sky for changes. When a transient event such as a supernova is noted, a worldwide event will be issued or worldwide alert will be issued within an astounding 60 seconds for, for detailed study. Daily reports will be issued and a comprehensive annual report will be issued each year to detail the accumulating process of the survey with time. To quote the LSST website, quote, 
To the user, the LSST is a database, not a telescope, end of quote. This database will be mined over and over by many users for various projects. The education and public outreach programs of the, of the LSST are as ambitious as a telescope itself. A planning committee has been operational since the program began to gather inputs from the public in designing a program that is intended to provide non-specialists access to LSST data through tools and interfaces that engage various communities and groups with authentic astronomical research opportunities. To provide a link with the public an explicitly designed user-friendly online internet portal and several other interfaces will enable users to view the sky, access the photos, and participate in various educational and participatory activities. Customers for these services and activities will be, number one, the general public, number two, formal educators, three, citizen science investigators, and four, content developers, developers for science educational facilities. This education and public outreach program will enable amateur researchers to initiate projects, whoops, sorry about that, to initiate projects such as Galaxy Zoo using LSST data through the collaboration with Zooniverse and other online resources. The LSST education and outreach program anticipates that the number of citizen science projects in the astronomy field will dramatically increase when the LSST is operational, giving the whole new generation of citizen scientists the opportunity to deepen their engagement with astronomy using real data from the LSST. I'd like to suggest why not astronomy clubs? Why not the low brows? Why not the Warren Club getting involved with this program? So to summarize, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope Project will have a major impact on astronomy for the next decade and is unique in many ways. It will involve scientists, engineers, IT folks, educators, and citizens from many disciplines to ex execute and exploit this program. It will have a thousand fold increase in capabilities and will gather more data than all previous astronomical surveys. It will detect 20 billion galaxies or more than a hundred times those now known. Each photo image will encompass 40 times the area of the moon with a 15 second exposure that has more acuity and sensitivity than ever before. It will visit each point in the sky more than 800 times over 10 years and create the greatest astronomy movie ever made. And finally, it will create new methodologies for examining dark matter and dark energy. And after tonight, it will have a song dedicated to it. And if you'd like to get even more involved with this fascinating program, they're looking for a few good men and women with various skill sets to join them at locations throughout the US, Chile, and other locations. You can help them define the future of astronomy and answer some of the, of the mysteries of our universe. Check it out on www.lsst.org. And now to close my presentation, uh, actually I've got some additional comments after this, but I'd like to pay tribute to a project that a decade from now, we may look back upon with awe. I'm sure that Johann Strauss would not be offended at my borrowing his melody this endeavor and uh, Jeff I'm not sure whether you need to change the uh, thing on this but I'd like I'd like you all to sing along if everybody's muted with, to the words here that I'm sure you'll recognize the melody too the LLST is on its way to 
Cutting stars and Milky Way And happenings in the universe Like cosmic explosions and outbursts Looking for asteroids and things That intersect our planet's ring It's fast, wide, and deep It will show many things we've not seen before. Some good harmless, or even harmless. In the span of years, we'll see change appear. I will tell the truth that scientific way is past and wide and deep. And it's data by the heat. Cosmic answers we shall read. Cause the LLST will change astronomy. Do, 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 do. And now I've got a couple more slides that I'd like to share with you that I have in script, but I think raise an issue that we all should be concerned about. If we could go back to the main screen now, I'm going to stop share. Well, no, I have to. I have to do this. I guess. Let me figure out how to get back to these slides. The slides are still showing, Jim. Yeah, okay, here we go. I, w I want them to show, actually. Back in February, I was I was out in Arizona, and uh, as, you, as you all know, uh, we've, we've been privy to a lot of virtual presentation by people all over the world, actually. But I, I, I was listening to a presentation by a, a lady named Samantha Lauder from the Canadian Association of Physicists. She, uh, she was conducting a study above small objects in the, in the solar system using a wide field uh, telescope, that a uh, wide, wide field survey telescope that I'll show you just a mock-up in, in a moment here. And they, she, they were studying small orbital objects and, and actually they were, the, the presentation was called Planet Nine or Planet Nine. They were searching for that mystery planet that has been talked about through decades and centuries. So is planet nine, the number nine, or planet nine, the German spelling for nine. It was kind of a clever word. So she, she raised the issue, her last five or 10 minutes with four or five slides of which I have a couple here, of a problem that is going to interfere with the LSST telescope project. And that was not recognized by the planners when it started, when the project started, because it had not even started, the, the uh, program had not even started. It was about the SpaceX program for Starlink satellites that I think some of you are, are familiar with. Uh, I then uh, came across an article and in, in, uh, uh, it was in one of the astronomy magazines showing uh, this picture Somebody in England has done a study showing that even without the SpaceX Starlink uh, uh, satellite constellations, that there are some, depending upon the size that you're talking about, 30 to 50,000 pieces of junk out there in near Earth orbit. And that it has already compromised the blackness of the sky, if you will, by 10%. So you can go to the darkest spot on Earth and you're still 10% compromised over what it was a century ago. And she went on to uh, show another slide here which shows the Starlink satellite constellation as it was uh, known at, at that time of, of the tracks across the uh, area that the LSST would be uh, we'd be uh, 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 observing. This is, uh, this is the, the camera they were using for their study 
which doesn't have quite the, the wide field aspect of the LSST, but it shows a simulation of these Starlink satellites going across. And it also then listed other, as you may or may not know, uh, Musk's Starlink program eventually is approved for some 42,000 satellites to, uh, to achieve his goals. And these are some other companies here that are also going to be competing with him. So the, uh, the, uh, compute, uh, the, the LSST program, uh, did some compute, some, uh, calculations on it and they anticipate that even with measures that Musk has taken to darken his satellites that some 30% of the observational time of the LSST will be will be lost and so I'd just like to open the the uh, uh, maybe open our mics up here and talk a little bit about this because I think this is something where the astronomical community has really been caught with its pants down there's no inputs, and, and if you go online and Google this subject, you'll see there's a lot of conversation going on now, but nobody anticipated this. Nobody was paying attention to us, and now it's almost an accomplished fact, and we may be the last generation that can remember skies before or looking out at, uh, uh, at our heavens before and after uh, pristine skies. So with that, uh, I'll be willing to take any questions or whatever you want to do. Questions for Jim? Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing here. Yeah, that might help. Yeah, we can see people. Or if, if and uh, if I need to, I'll go back to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm back with you. Anybody have a question? Oh, come on. We never oh, have no questions. I must have answered all your questions. That, that's great. <laughs> oh, well, we mentioned that, that, that Pat Feitcher also uh, talked about this recently. So uh, he answered a lot of the questions uh, uh, not too long ago. I have uh, my, question. my question was uh, something it may have been in a presentation I may have missed, but what was the estimated date again for completion of the Vera Rubin Space Telescope? Late, late next year. Okay. Late next year. I, I think only was there. Go I'm ahead. sorry? Are they going to use those bright lasers to make the image, you know, like the seeing better? No, you're talking, you're talking about the, uh, the adaptive optics? Correct. Are they going to use that with the LSST? No, it's not possible with the type of program they're doing. That, that's what limits the uh, the acuity of, of uh, or the resolution <laughs> of the telescope to point, point 0.7 arc seconds. The, the telescope itself is capable of going down to point 0.2 arc seconds. But with the unsteady uh, atmosphere, even at 8,200 8, feet up in the Andes, uh, they they can't they can't do the uh, because of the the program is taking picture after picture after picture after picture. It, it, uh, as I understand it, the adaptive optics will not be part of the program. So it's not going to be part. So the LSST won't be able to capture um, faint objects or faint galaxies because of it. No, 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 it will be able to, it, it will be, it's going to capture objects down to 27 magnitude. Oh, wow. And, and with, an, with a, a resolution of 0.7 arc seconds. Now the, the detailed study of- a, That's say, the question, yes. How yeah, detailed those was, images yeah. gonna be without adaptive optics? It will it will discover these images and within 60 seconds will issue a worldwide alert for other telescopes around the world and the Hubble and 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 uh, any other space telescope to target 
that particular transient object in detail. Got it. So it's more dedicated for like asteroids and, um, you know, moving objects, correct? Well, no, 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 that's not true. For example, it's been estimated uh, that uh, there's one supernova that goes off in a galaxy every every century, I believe is the, is the, the number I've heard. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes it difficult to discover as supernovas, which are the standard candle of the uh, expansion of the universe. Mm -hmm. This has all been going on here, you know, the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. And so far, they've only been able to discover like a thousand supernova. The LSST will discover nearly a million of them because it, it will be looking at so many galaxies. It will then pass on when they see one of these transient events, they'll be able to pass it on to the Hubble or to, uh, to other large telescopes to study in detail, to study the light curve over the two or three week period that the supernova is active. Interesting, thanks. What type of software will you, uh, amateurs need to uh, access the system once it's all uh, uh, set up? I'm, I'm really not too familiar with it. I, I mentioned a couple of them in the presentation and their site, if you go to the uh, LSST uh, site, there's all kinds of information and detail about how you can access those uh, programs. Thank you. Do you know if uh, time on the LSST has already been booked um, years in advance, or are they waiting for it to come online? Do you know? No, it's 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 already programmed, Adrian. This this uh, this device I was talking about. It's a control system that that will operate the telescope, and essentially it will. I mean, their dream is that they'll push a button and it'll run for 10 years. And uh, of course that won't happen because there is weather and so on and so forth. But, uh, but no, it will not be available to, you know, on request for, for special purposes, unless, I guess, unless some really amazing thing happens the way I understand it. Jack, don't you have a question? <laughs> Not at this time, no. <laughs> Good to see you. You too, pal. Anybody else? <laughs> okay. Okay, well, thank you all. Yeah, we appreciate it once again, Jim. I would much rather have done this live, but uh, we do yeah. what we have to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, hey, we'll have to have you back yet again, and we'll be live next time. Huh? I'm I'm working on my my next presentation, and I do this every every September at Cranbrook Institute for the Warren Club. Been doing it live for 13 years, and my next one is about the uh, the uh, Giant Magellan Telescope. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that with that one, which is using seven of these 8.4 meter mirrors. Whoa. Kind of a kind of an interesting detailed telescope. Definitely oh. like tiny on my lips, but looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I'll have to talk to you about the uh, McMahon Hubert uh, Astronomical Society because I recently became a member of that. Um, we won't won't have to go into specifics of what's going on with the club. You shared yeah. it with the uh, Warren team, but. Um, I am interested in if there are any meetings, I will get with you offline um, yeah. as far as uh, getting more involved with that club. Okay. Give, give me a call, Adrian. We'll do. Okay. Take it easy. See y'all. See you, Jim. Oh, Thank one you. One thing. Uh, yes, when I asked Jim about uh, our little gift of a hat or a t-shirt, because I couldn't remember what we had given him before, Jim came up with a really novel idea that we actually haven't had a request for before. And that is a free membership, your membership in our club. And I thought, well, that's cool. And I don't think anybody would object to that, would they? Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> I approve. Yeah, yeah. 
So hopefully, I think Doug Scoble is out there someplace. Yeah, I vote yes. Yep, I do. Yeah. Second. Anyway, okay. uh, if Doug's not listening in, I'll get a hold of him so he can send you all of our club info and all that stuff. And uh, welcome to the club, Jim. Okay, thank you, Charlie. I, thank uh, you. I'll, I'll proudly wear my hat. There you go. <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see you guys. Have a, have a nice okay. meeting. You, you too. too. Thanks. Bye. All right. So with that, uh, the only thing I wanted to... Oh, we got to go back to camera, regular camera view. I think we already have. I can see you, Charlie. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, maybe it's regular. on my side. I'm just seeing. Hang on a second. I'm trying to get it so I can see everybody here. There we go. Okay. It switched on me. I didn't tell it to do that. <laughs> anyway. Uh, anyway, I just put out. Uh, uh, a request to do an officers meeting. Uh, hopefully we'll pull that together in the new future or have a report for you on what we discussed there. And uh, I think actually I've heard back from every officer as far as what days or uh, nights that they can or cannot meet with the exception of Jack, uh, yeah, Jack and Krishna. So when you get a you chance- send it out? yesterday i think yeah like last night i believe oh okay sometime yesterday so yeah when you hopefully when you get a chance just let me know your thoughts and i'll stir this all up and propose some time to get that done so uh i think that's all i've really got so i will move on to other officers starting with one of our newest ones and that is the return of liz calhoun liz I was uh, doing my best to stay muted and stay camera dark just to conserve on bandwidth. So my news is uh, you officers know I, well, uh, to refer to a famous movie, I am the key master momentarily. <laughs> so so we, we do have the keys to Peach Mountain. Um, and I hope uh, Jim and Jenny are now officially in Seattle enjoying their grandchildren. Um, but I think you all received our contact information in the great hopes that up the road shortly we can have some open houses at, at Peach Mountain. So uh, that's my report at this point. Thank you, Liz. And I believe I see Dave Jorgensen out there. There he is. Anything, Dave? I saw something that said Dave George. Can you hear me? Yeah, Hello? no, we got you. Oh, there you go. Yep. We, see, we hear you. Hello. Yeah, we got you. <laughs> go ahead, Dave. Interesting. Dave. can hear you. Yeah. Oh, no, we can hear us. Okay, no, we can hear you, Dave. Well, well I'm, I'm having, having trouble here. here. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yeah you're good. Okay. 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 Well, uh, well, okay, uh, so, so, so I'm, I'm talking, talking on my telephone, telephone but I've also got, got my internet working. Which goes, goes in, and in and out. In and out. So you got to mute your speaker. Yeah, mute one of the speakers. Yeah. 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 Can, you Can you hear me okay? okay? Yep. Yeah, that's better. Huh? No. <laughs> unfortunately, I'm going to give my report separately on email. Okay, got it. It does sound a little interplanetary or something. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Moving or on. Or he's enough of a ball player. Yeah. <laughs> Anything to report, Joy? Thank you for doing the minutes. Nothing specific, just keeping up on the two websites, or well, the one website and then the one email for the notifications that we're doing everything online still. I'm glad you mentioned website. Did, did somebody sign into Google Calendar from the Mac computer a little bit ago? Yes, that was me. Okay, cool. Um, so I got the notification. Troubleshooting and doing stuff. As we speak. Got it. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Joy. Adrian. All right. I'll try to keep it brief. I've been doing outreach as a part of uh, Explore Scientific's uh, Global Star Parties. Um, there are a lot of notable guests that are on that show, such as David Leakby. Um, let's see, Sarah Kafka, who is the head of AAVSO. A uh, couple of uh, astronomers, David Eicher, comes to mind. It's a mix of both professional and amateur astronomers. And um, I have somehow managed to end up in this group. So they, uh, have, they tend to happen every Tuesday night. And the website is explorescientific.com. I'm usually on there. There's going to be one Saturday covering the lunar eclipse. So that's, that's basically all I have to report. Okay, thank you, Adrian. And how about our latest newsletter editor, Amy Condu? Uh, nothing to report. Cool, that was concise. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, now, did I see Doug Scoble in the uh, audience or not? I don't hear him, so. I know I actually saw him physically just yesterday. He said he was going to join tonight, but apparently something's gone wrong right. for him. Yeah, I don't but, see him uh, in the listing. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he turns out he had to do a dentist appointment and had great difficulty getting into a dentist up in Traverse City, at least anything in the near future. So he came down to his dentist that he had down here in Ann Arbor. So he had to make a trip all the way down, like a three and a half hour trip each way for a dentist appointment. But I did present the opportunity for me to get the uh, uh, baseball hats, the latest the ones that we ordered to him. And uh, also just so I'm thinking of it, some point Jack, I want to get, uh, he's got, I had an envelope that had the Celestron, I think that Celestron Star Hopper, some books with it, but I can't remember, is that back at the observatory or on loan or? I, Celestron Star Hopper, I'd have to go look in the observatory. I, uh, yeah. I'd have to look in there. I can't remember, so. At any rate, I've got the books for it, so we'll have to get those back at the telescope at some point. But uh, anyway, I did see Doug briefly, so. Uh, but he's not here tonight. So how about Krishna? Yeah, so, well, I'll just give it up in my webmaster capacity. <laughs> so um, at our last meeting of the communicate, our first meeting of the communications committee, we had a couple, a few things that were on the agenda. Um, so one was to figure out how to um, make it easier basically for one person to post to our multiple different social platforms. So we do have a lowbrow blog, which probably almost nobody who wasn't on the call knows or remembers. Um, and that's on Blogspot, which is run by Google. We have a Facebook page, we have an Instagram page, and we have a Twitter account. Um, so Charlie, the emails you were seeing was me trying to unsuspend our Twitter account, which just happened. So we're back online there. Um, and I have it set up now that basically if I wrote this down, so if you post to the blog, then that posts to Twitter and Facebook. If you post anything on Instagram, that also posts to Twitter and Facebook. And if you add a new event to our calendar, then that posts to Twitter and Facebook. 
theme here is that nobody needs to directly post to Twitter or Facebook. They can post to one of these three other items and then it gets replicated. And that was based off the discussion that we had where it seems like, you know, uh, Ginia is, uh, you know, Dave, um, uh, for, uh, Jim, sorry, Jim Forrester's wife um, is pretty much the only one who posts on our lowbrow Instagram account. Um, so that gets some traffic. Uh, and then uh, talking with Adrian, his preferred way to kind of, because he was managing the Facebook side of things and talking to Adrian, his preferred way to to do this, to get um, posts to show up in both places is to post to the blog. And then from there, it'll automatically replicate to Twitter and Facebook. So that's all set up. Um, and we just have to try testing it out with a few test posts. Um, so that's up and running. The other thing that we talked about doing was um, uh, getting the event notifications back up. So as you may recall, um, what we we used to do was we would have both an online or both a phone number. So if someone wanted to check the event status, they would call that phone number and there would be a recorded message from Charlie saying whether it's a go or no go. Um, and to supplement that, we have um, uh, uh, the event status going to Twitter and to Facebook. Now all those links broke and it wasn't really possible to reactivate them the way that I was doing them. But I have a new method, which I'll share with Charlie because basically Charlie and the open house coordinator are the only people who would need to know this information, I think on a regular basis. Um, so I just tested it, it's, it's working now. You'll see a test tweet on our Twitter account if you are following that. Um, so Charlie, that's back up and running. So if and when we do start resuming our kind of in-person events, um, then you can give the go, no go, um, much in the way that you used to. It's basically sending an email again, but it's a little bit. I was going to ask the same credentials. Then as we it's not the exact same, but I'll, I'll, I'll share that with you separately. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, so that's up. And then, um, the other things that we talked about, uh, were revamping the astronomy website um and uh that is still in progress um the task that we're doing next is to try to find um uh, uh a hosting provider that would be easy and convenient i guess it's kid hour huh <laughs> did you say hi to howney's <laughs> kids <laughs> looks looks like his daughter's there too oh she keeps it's disappearing though. <laughs> she, she she disappears into the background <laughs> i don't have a virtual background so you're just here um, yeah, so we're, so that's, uh, uh, what we're looking at and, uh, I'm exploring Squarespace as an option. I think Jeff was going to look into WordPress. Um, and we're just kind of right now exploring that to see, and the goal is to make it as easy as possible for anyone to post, uh, without any technical abilities. I mean, our current website, um, you know, pretty much I'm the only one who can do anything because it often requires coding HTML and then syncing that using an FTP server things that I think it would be hard for any, many other people to do unless they are, are knowledgeable in those domains already. Um, but the advantage of some of these code host providers like Squarespace is that we just have to give someone in the club an account access and they can log in and kind of do it pretty easily just through, through a browser. Um, so, and then I think I'm caught up in terms of posting things. I just posted uh, the May newsletter. Um, so I think that's all that people have asked me to post. Um, and then as we also discussed at the communications meeting, um, some of the issues with our lowbrows.org domain and youngastronomers.org have been fixed at least as of now. Um, all right, I think those are the only updates I have. Sorry, Joey, if I was talking fast. <laughs> You've been busy. I, I can send the, uh, uh, the uh, communications meeting notes to Joy if she wants uh, more detail. Okay, that's it, Krishna. Uh, that's all webmaster okay. wise. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. And then last but not least, Jeff. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> on the observatory, uh, there is an issue with the Argo Navis they're going to have to work on. Uh, some of you are familiar with the Argo Navis, and I am having a. Uh, uh, there, we should show up on your screen, I believe. Come on, come on, come on. Okay, okay. now, 
what I'm showing you here is a, it says RTC battery flat. Uh, we keep putting in new coin batteries and it keeps rejecting them. Uh, it still says it's flat and doesn't record that there's a new battery in there. And uh, uh, we're gonna take a look at the circuit board here and see if we can find out the reason behind it. Uh, this is what you see. And then this is what happens when it's flat, the date and time are automatically set back to 2000. Now the units over 10 to 15 years old, I know that. But that's what happens because the coin battery takes care of these settings. The other settings are taken care of by the AA battery set, which I replace those with new Duracells. In those settings, it still holds in the unit. So the only thing are the settings that are based on the coin battery. I don't know if it's something in the coin battery, uh, how the two contacts, maybe one of the contacts is bad or something or if it's something in the circuit board. You know what you might try, Jack, is to take the center contacts that touch the middle of the battery and bend those up just a little bit. Yes, yes, you're correct. We did that, I tried that. Okay. And I also took, um, there's a certain way when you put the battery in, there's a top contact that you push down and I have a little rubber contact for that. I used my finger to hold it in place so I tried to reset it. And I know I had pressure on it, hmm. but still wouldn't do any good. So uh, the batteries I'm using came from Panasonic through Amazon. You get a battery pack of five of them. So I tested a couple different batteries and I still got the same results. So I am not sure why it's doing that. Uh, we'll have to look at it a little bit more and get a little more involved with that. Um, that's all I have on this particular issue. And if we uh, can't get this fixed, uh, then we'll discuss an appropriate replacement. But let's, we're gonna first try and fix this or get some things worked out first before we do anything. And uh, we'll take it from there. Maybe uh, we should try is uh, if we can absolutely determine a battery, it's a three volt 2032 I'm guessing. No, it's a 1220 Panasonic. That's why I ordered from Amazon. 1220. Oh, yeah. Not everybody amazing. carries 1220s. I used to get them out of money. Yeah. They aren't carrying them anymore. I got one a couple years ago from the battery shop, but uh, I put it in last year and then this thing failed again. So I ordered new ones mm. from Amazon from Panasonic and 1220s, three volt. And I've had, I've tried a couple of them on there, still hasn't done any good. So I'm going to play with it some more and we'll take it from there and see what happens. Why it's did losing you, the settings. Did you, did you measure the voltage on the new batteries to make sure they're actually good? No, I'm assuming that they were good because there's five batteries in a pack uh, and it came straight from Panasonic. But uh, you're right, that is an issue. Uh, I've got to take a little measuring device out there and check the batteries just to make sure. Yeah, but that's kind of where I was going because that's one thing. I don't know if that's a lithium battery or not, but I know it's lithium. Of, yeah, that's the problem with lithiums. That sucker could measure three volts and actually be bad. Well, I'll have to find out. It could be. Yeah, I don't know. That's why sometimes it's good to have a known good one that works yeah. on another device as a, you know, a test, so. Yeah, that, I don't have another device. All mine are the new 30, I think the 3220s or something like that, the bigger yeah. ones. This is the Jack, only thing that uses the 1220. Jack, the other yep. thing you want to do is take a look for corrosion either in the battery holder contacts or possibly broken solder joint between it and the circuit board. Yes, so, correct. Given the age and temperature cycling, yep. corrosion and broken solder joints are the likely, likeliest suspects. I looked at the uh, contacts and they're still shiny, but that's why we want to look at the circuit board, right? Yeah, take, something take a on pencil, here over take time. Take a pencil eraser, a pencil eraser to clean the contacts will work fine. Yeah, those work good. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. well, one of the other things is uh, if there's you know have a, if there's a capacitor on the board in the system, uh, a, a faulty soldering connection on a uh, you know, perhaps a low microfarad capacitor. Yes, yeah, that was one of the things that, you know that some of the people talked about. And you're right. Uh, the idea is having to go through and take it apart and everything. So yeah. we'll do some more testing, and then we'll uh, uh, take it apart, look at it from there. Okay. I'm going to let's see. Can I do this right? No. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, and I'll I'll talk to the, the group. Uh, is our tree maintenance group, and we've got uh, four or five people in that. Um, looked at some days this week until I looked at the rain dates, and it's it's raining out there again Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And I think Thursday night it starts again. Let's we'll see what happens Saturday if the rain changes and maybe Wednesday was looking like that might work out. But I'll contact the group tonight and we'll we'll see how how this works out. Uh, it hasn't been that great and the wind's been really bad out there, these 30 mile gusts. And I was doing some maintenance as tops of these trees just go back and forth. So that's not gonna work out. Uh, other than that, that's all I got to report. And I'm probably gonna send an email back out to Don Foley and Dave Jorgensen, because we talked to him about looking at that uh, uh, board. And uh, we can do some work on that, on that uh, Argo Davis. Man. So uh, that's all I have for now. Uh, oh, I have not heard any word on the AT&T Tower yet. So they're still playing games with that. And I noticed in the planning commission meetings, there was no recommendations or meetings on that either. So evidently, I don't know what the real holdup is on that. So uh, I'm not going to put my two cents worth in. Uh, I'll let them figure out what they want to do first. And then we'll take it from there how it affects us or how, how the U of M is going to look at it. We'll let them decide first what they want. Right. So yeah, it's better off let them let them handle that. Um, and it, like I said, as for open houses, I know we, we've talked about it, but I don't see nothing until U of M comes out with a clarification on how they want to handle it. And I know all the changes go in effect July 1st when they, when they reduce all the restrictions in that. So I'll play that by the U of M and how they determine the outcome from on, uh, these open houses and what we're doing with that. Other than that, that's all I have to say for right now. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, that brings us brings us to Jeff. Is there anybody who, who can hear me or not? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you, Dave. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, I'm talking on the telephone, which is a little bit to the side of my picture. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to report that. Uh, we met with, uh, there's a group called uh, the Chelsea Dark Sky Organization. It's a group, a small group of 10 to 12 people and who have been meeting with the uh, Chelsea officials to try to uh, improve the, the lighting conditions in Chelsea. Um, this, our meeting yesterday was uh, our second meeting and uh, the officials that were attended the meeting were uh, quite positive about uh, our efforts. And uh, so they have asked us to supply more information about uh, different lighting sources that will help to reduce the, the Chelsea dome light, which is a real problem for me uh, when I'm looking at the sky to the east. That's all I see is, uh, is the Chelsea sky dome. Anyway, so this is a, a small group that just got started a couple of months ago, and uh, hopefully they can uh, they can improve the situation out here. That's all I've got. Thanks for getting involved in that, Dave. Yes. Uh, also, uh, I attended one of their planning commission meetings out in Chelsea a couple of weeks ago, and uh, they read your letter that you wrote in that. 
And uh, there's a couple people that made comments. So that was a good letter that you wrote to him, Dave. Okay, good. Okay, Jeff. Well, uh, tonight we had 36 peak viewers, 34 and 2 uh, for Zoom and uh, YouTube. Uh, on the 5th of May, we did have our first uh, communications meeting, and it, well, it uh, lasted, looks, I didn't write down the uh, end time, but went from 8 o'clock to about an hour or so. Uh, and basically, uh, Krishna covered a, a lot of the web stuff and online things that we, uh, we talked about. But we also covered some uh, issues regarding like email uh, usage uh, and how it's used. And uh, Jim Forrester is going to uh, come up with a draft for our next meeting that we can kind of get out and, you know, uh, publicize on uh, good practices and how to use the resources that we do have. Uh, we talked a little bit about mass mailing and some other groups uh, like groups.io or gr uh, Google Groups, those kinds of things for getting word out. Uh, that's web stuff. Uh, few issues uh, just with how things are working with the newsletter and how maybe better to integrate that with things. Uh, Krishna covered the social media and then we were basically talking about when we get back to doing in-person activities, uh, some of the things that, you know, maybe we're going to have to consider of uh, getting the word out with, you know, outreach calendars, etc. Uh, maybe uh, more active participation, getting the word out through the uh, Michigan Math and Science uh, Scholars, GLAC, the AATBA, etc. So we had we had decent attendance and uh, good participation, and I think it was a good kickoff. Our next meeting is going to be on uh, July 7th. We're basically doing first Wednesdays a month every other month at 8 p.m. So it was a success, and everybody had a little bit of stuff on their to-do list after we got done, and uh, hopefully July 7th we'll come back and we'll get some more stuff to report back to, to you guys. So, ta-da, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Does anybody have anything else that they'd like to bring up? Anyone? 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 Okay. Nope, I'm good. All right. Okay, I don't see or hear anybody. So with that, oh, I'm going to entertain a motion. Whoop, did I hear something? Motion. motion to adjourn. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> Support? Support. Okay. I assume if anybody objected, it's not going to carry any weight anyway. So with that, <laughs> thanks, everybody, and have a good evening. Try to stay cool. <laughs> have a great weekend, guys. So we're, so we're not going to the pizza house tonight, are we? Probably not. <laughs> oh, darn. All right, then. Okay. Maybe can't do May attendance chart. <laughs> da, 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 da. And Amy's got our attendance chart. It looks beautiful. <laughs> Jack, did you take that and put a adapter on it and just hook some, you know, alligators to it and move the dial to the three volt and just see if it still acts like it has that low battery problem in it? No, because the only thing that there, um, the two contact points, uh, I'd have to measure battery separate and then put a battery in there and probably measure each contact with the battery and to see if it is getting contact. But if the battery is good, I know the connections are good. They're not cracked or broken or rusted or anything like that. And they should, if you got a good battery, it should transfer the energy without a problem. But uh, there are some things you can do once you take the unit apart and some testing you can do. But that's the only way. You can't see the inside of the circuit board from the Argo Navis. It's got to be taken apart. Seems and like if it's that old, you might as well just... Well, let's see what we have to do with it first. But yeah, I, if it does go, then we'd have to buy a replacement. And then I, I would look at what's out in the market. 
and see what is good to use there. All right. I was just curious if you tried to bypass the whole battery system and see if it still had the same error message on the screen. I, you'd have to. I just, I'm too cheap. Anything that takes batteries and I use it where there's an AC on the wall, I'll buy an adapter and solder it to the leaves and skip it. So I was just well, wondering if you tried to see if you can get it to get rid of the error message and see if that worked or not. But button batteries are so tiny and hard to do that sort of thing. Yeah. The other argument is I don't know if I'd want to do that unless I had some other type of detection equipment to make sure I don't uh, overload that system. I, I'd be a little concerned. I got to be careful to make sure I don't screw it up. So yeah, that's why I was trying to get another battery and it used the batteries in that. The batteries I got were brand, well, I got them from Amazon. They're new from, they're made by Panasonic. That's why I want them. Because there are not that many people that make 1220s anymore. And yeah, I've never heard of that one. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a small one about the size of a dime. So that's, that, that's part of the problem. So first generation hearing aid battery. Um, <laughs> It might, it, it could be, because I think I had one other, uh, I can't remember what it was, but I haven't used 1220s. The only thing I use them is on the, uh, the Argo Navis. Everything I've got around here is like the 3220s or what's that, 3019s and some other types. And that stuff yeah. they use in your flashlight battery casings and that now that they have the 2032 20, and the 2025s i've got yeah. and the, yeah, i buy them by a 20 pack of them you know on the sheets of them but yeah 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 okay i thought i'd try but all right no i get your point because i could see putting a tester on and doing something like that but you have to shut and reload everything redo the settings and turn it back on to see if it kept the settings now so yeah there's some things you have to do it's kind of Test the batteries with the multimeter first. Yep. All right. Have fun, everybody. Okay. Uh, have a good weekend. If, uh, if I come out there to look at it with you, I'd bring the focuser for the cave telescope. And we could, yes. We could take a look at that also. And we could set that up and put that on there too. Yeah. We could, yeah. So we should probably get a date together. Uh, I don't know what your schedule's like. We'll do that via email. I have to look at my calendar too. Yeah. Generally, I'm available. Okay, I, I'll send you an email tonight, you and Dave, and then we'll we'll figure something out, yeah. and then uh, we'll go out there and do that. We can put the the uh, focuser on. We can test that, and uh, we can get a lot accomplished. That's all right. Okay, I'm gonna sign off then. Any other questions? Anything? Going once. Well, good night. And as they say, I do this right. Live long and prosper. <laughs> See you guys. Right.